Hello and welcome to this video and on this video I will be discussing the 10 greatest artists from America, the continent of. Okay, um, and I will be ranking them from 10 to 1. So by America I mean people, artists, bands that are not from Britain, England, they're not from Europe, they're not from Asia, they're from America, right? Primarily from North America. Um, and primarily from the United States of America and Canada, right? As that's made everybody happy. Um, on a recent video, I described um, a number of bands from America. I think it was Utopia and Kansas and Rush. And all the Rush fans got very upset saying they're not an American band, they're Canadian. I actually made a mistake and I will confess it here. I will now do penance for all the people, the hundreds of people who have criticised me for doing this. I am sorry I meant North America. But I was trying to collect these bands together and discuss them because North American progressive rock is, is, is quite a rare thing in the classic era especially there's not that many bands and also when we put them up against on the whole when we put them up against the sort of british progressive rock bands they rank pretty low in in the scale of popularity sales but also in the scale of um how much they're loved by the progressive rock community but they are loved and i thought they need some love and i wanted to um you know do a list on these bands now some of these bands i'm a huge fan of some of these bands i'm not so I'm going to give you a very personal ranking here. It's definitely my subjective opinion here because some of these bands um, I'm just not that knowledgeable about. And the first band I have at number 10, which is Mars Volta, is one of those bands. Um, I first came across Mars Volta, I suppose, in the early 2000s when Francis the Mute, that album, came out. I went and got a copy of that album. I thought it was interesting it it it's it was a sort of um quite heavy metal proggy metal but with much more abstract sort of zappery king crimson aspects to it i thought it was good um i often will get put off by modern production with prog metal bands i don't know if mars volta could be described as a prog metal band but i think as time has gone on you know a few you know years later i think mars volta really represented at the time a pretty popular um, progressive rock band, which they were, that um, brought a lot of young people to the genre. They were pr pretty exploratory, incredible musicianship. And so that's as about as much as I can tell you about Mars Volta, you know, in terms of what I've done. I, I, I was going to do some um, research on these bands, but I thought the reason why I they do not figure in my worldview might be more interesting than me just trying to do some research and trot out something that I'm not really aware of. So in Mars Volta's case, I think they're a really, really interesting band. I, I like the fact that they are drawing from the more darker end of progressive rock, Mavish, Nordstra, King Crimson, um, because I think those influences became more important later on into progressive rock than they were, say, in the early 80s when Neoprog sort of emerged and I think Mars Volta are a key band in, in sort of popularizing those influences I knew as a Mavish new fan when the Mars Volta came out a lot of my students were coming to me and saying you've got to check out Mars Volta you'll love them you know they sound like the Mavish Nocturne. Uh and I think they uh, mentioned the Mavish Nocturne in interviews as being an influence so um, that's about as much as I can say for uh, Mars Volta who I've got at number 10 a very important band at number nine I have uh, the progressive rock band Styx. Now Styx to me are almost like uh, the, the greatest example of an, a, 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 uni a United States of America prog band. Um, a band that emerges after the classic British progressive rock bands emerge that try and ape that style and then in America, especially in the late 70s, when the record companies now want to see some sort of success, they move towards a much more slicker AOR style. Um, there's a whole ton of bands where this happens, and a couple of the bands on this list 
where this happens too. Well, I'll, I'll give you an example of another band where this happened is Chicago. Chicago actually emerged in the late 60s as a, a really cutting ed, edge, progressive jazz fusion group, you know, that are really loved within the community. As the, as the um, decade progresses, I think what happened with British progressive rock bands is that they met punk. And punk challenged the very um, uh, essence of what progressive rock was. In America, punk didn't have such a big, important uh, effect on progressive music. What happened in America was disco. And disco was suddenly selling loads of records. And the record companies came around sort of looking at bands that were signed in the mid-70s, saying, well, you know, where's our hit? And I think Sticks are an, ex an example of a band that that um, have done that and then go on to have huge chart success with something which is still, you know, progressive rock influence. So that's my take on Sticks. I've never really listened to Sticks, you know, um, at all. So that's as much as I can say. Uh, this is, when I made this list, I thought, oh my God, am I gonna have to talk about Sticks or should I just take them on the list and I'll find, I'll, I'll pick a band that I know. And I thought, no, sticks have to go on the list. They're going to be mentioned, you know. So, um, Star Castle, move out the way. You know, Saga, move out the way. You know, I'm going to have to put sticks on. And it's because of the popularity of the band. So that's who I've got at number nine is sticks. All right. Um, number eight is a, is a band I can talk a little bit more about. This, for me, is a truly progressive rock band. Although late to the party in terms of the genre. At number eight, I have Happy the Man. Um, which are an instrumental progressive rock band that emerged in the mid 70s. They made two incredible albums, um, which you could describe as sort of the genesis end of progressive rock, but a little bit more over on the jazz fusion side. It it's often sounds like jazz fusion, but without uh, the solos, uh, a lot more about the orchestration. But there's a funkiness and a fluidity and a, and a beauty in the playing, which is very jazzy. Um, Happy the Man um, come up over and over again on this channel when I mention American progressive rock bands. Um, in terms of their sales and their appeal, this is instrumental music. It's, it's, its appeal is quite limited. But I think as time has gone on, they are looked on very fondly by progressive rock fans and I think they should be on this list. Um, I listened to those two albums quite a lot. I like them very much. In, in terms of my opinion on them, it rates in the same area as like say Bruford, which is Bruford's band in the late 70s, or perhaps Brand X. And I prefer those bands more. And I think if either Bruford's band or Brand X was on the list here, they would knock this band out. And this is the whole point I wanted to make. This is this is why I didn't research this. You know, I'm pretty knowledgeable on press, progressive rock, you know, uh, but I listen to a lot of other music, a lot of jazz fusion, a lot of jazz, a lot of experimental music. I listen to lots of hip hop. I listen to lots of um, electronic music. I've got a wide range of, of, of knowledge of music. These bands I have checked out when I was younger and gone, yeah, they're all right, and moved on. And yet, when we come up to come up with a list of the 10 greatest progressive rock bands, and I've tried to be as objective as I can, we start to have to put these bands on the list. If these were British progressive rock bands, I do not think they would make a list of, of, of British progressive rock bands. This is incredible when you imagine that, um, you know, the United States of America is 10 times the size of, you know, Britain. Canada is 10 times the size of Britain. It's the home of rock music. It has all that instrumental virtuosity that comes through that sort of jazz education system that exists in America, which we don't have here in the UK. So it's really surprising. You know why? You know why? You know what's missing from this? It's what I call the English aesthetic. I'm doing a number of videos at the moment about what I call the English aesthetic and its importance to the progressive rock genre. Um, and this is why I slightly differentiate between what I would call proper progressive rock, you know, which is the sort of British derived progressive rock and European progressive rock, which is definitely progressive rock, but it's a different thing. And that comes out of a much more sort of European existentialist revolutionary sort of approach to progressive rock. I'm thinking bands like Magma, Can, Faust, um, 
And, and in England, there was there were bands like Henry Cow uh, that also pursued that much more, um, you know, the, the rock rock in opposition bands that really um, were much more countercultural, revolutionary, what wanted to shake the system up. Whereas I think um, the classic uh, progressive rock bands are much more rooted in whimsy, and they're much more rooted in a in a sort of love of the English countryside and what that represents of a sort of pastoral um, um, idea of what rock music could be and, a, and one that's um, rooted in sort of the literary history of England that's, you know, sort of about romant the romantic poets, the sort of uh, nonsense um, authors like Edward Lee and Lewis Carroll, all of that I'm, I'm really trying to get... Um, a handle on on the, some videos at the moment so I, I, so the people who watch this channel can really get what I mean by the English aesthetic. I think America, although the American Constitution and what's embodied in that and the ideas of freedom and democracy that then we see emerge inside jazz and blues and jazz can almost be seen as the American dream embodied in music created by Afro-Americans who did not have access to that very thing. It's an incredible art form, right? Uh, but that does not transfer into progressive rock because obviously if you bring that into um, rock music, you end up with jazz fusion. Jazz fusion holds its hands with progressive rock. And I think obviously uh, American fusion bands have always been able to trump British fusion bands very easily but it's the opposite is with prog. So that's my long discussion of when I listen to Happy the Man, they're fantastic because they just have that fusion element in there, which just, the you know, Americans are so good at doing. Right, let's move on um, to number seven. Right, number seven, I have a band that I own albums by, I've listened to them a lot. I don't like them that much, but they had to go on the list and I know I'm gonna upset people. At number seven, I have Tool. Um, Tool, again, like Mars Volta, a very important band of taking um, prog metal, you know, and prog metal can be seen as definitely a sort of um, American take on metal, which brings in um, aspects of progressive rock that are coming from British progressive rock bands but channeled through uh, Rush basically <laughs> uh, and uh, I think once prog metal emerged you know with um, Fate's Warning, Dream Theatre and Queen's Reich in the late 80s the um, you then had the whole grunge thing happen with Nirvana and Nirvana was pursuing a much darker type of heavy rock, heavy metal that's coming out of Sabbath, but in Nirvana's case, and I think in Soundgarden's case, he's also coming out of King Crimson, and Tool, uh, that band that take the influences of King Crimson and channel them down into sort of a progressive rock, progressive metal way of approaching music. Um, when I describe it, I feel like I should really like them. And when I first heard them, um, I first heard them when Lateralus came out and sort of took over the world, it was probably the biggest prog, album of that year uh when i got that album i found there was a they, it was turgid and boring it never really seemed to get out of um second gear there was a something that they'd inherited from what i call moany metal bands like lincoln park where it's all sort of doom and gloom and it was all sort of leaden and i think people who like that sort of leaden depressing approach to music like tool i don't i like progressive rock because it's whimsical and light and it's and it's it can be funny and uplifting i don't find tool uplifting whatsoever do should they be on this list without a doubt they're one of the most pro important progressive rock bands of the last 30 years so that's who i have at number seven is tool right at number six we have kansas Kansas Like Sticks are the archetypal American prog band, a band for, formed in the early 70s as a response to British progressive rock bands. Um, they uh, bring all those inf influences together. And in Kansas, is, um, in, 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 in the, with Kansas, 
I think they actually do make a series of really classic progressive rock albums, albums that can vie up with the best of British progressive rock bands. I don't think they ever made a Close to the Edge or a Dark Side of the Moon, but they definitely made Left Overture, and Left Overture is a fantastic progressive rock band. With Kansas, when I listen to them, I can hear in the vocal something that is far more closer to soul and R&B. That's one difference that you hear, and you hear a level of instrumental virtuosity. The American musicians have always been incredible, and they're incredible virtuoso, and everything is like so tight and controlled. They may perhaps lack the individuality that you will get with a British progressive rock musician, like say a Keith Emerson or a Chris. Chris Squire or Phil Collins, you know, those, those musicians are iconic in their individuality. We don't, I don't so much get that with Kansas, maybe it's because I don't know their stuff so well. Um, but in terms of they, of classic American prog albums, there's probably about four, you know, especially if you take Rush out of the picture, there's probably about four that we would go for. And I think uh, Left Over Shore would definitely be one of those. So that's who I have at number six is Kansas, all right? At number five, we have Spock's Beard. Now, Spock's Beard are a newer progressive rock band. They've been around for 20, 30 years. Um, Spock's Beard are, have that whimsy, they have that fun, and they've got a deep appreciation of the British progressive rock bands not just Genesis and the obvious ones, but also there's a strong influence of Gentle Giant with Spock's Beard. Now, I'm not a huge Spock's Beard fan. I have a few of their albums, but in 2008, I actually uh, went on tour with Spock's Beard and I saw them up close every day. This is when Nick DiVigilio was still in the band uh, with... Um, you know, the sort of classic lineup without Neil Morse. And Neil Morse could have made this list as well. I think I think that Neil Morse and, and Spock's Beard and those guys really are, it is some of the best of actual American progressive rock. And what I saw on that tour was just an incredible band that could just jump through the prog hoops like nobody else. Uh, and what was interesting, I can remember one night watching uh, the drum solo there's two drummers um, in the band and they were sort of doing a double drum solo at the time. And um, they started to channel like the meters, heavy New Orleans funk. And I um, was really impressed that that was so strong in the band, that, 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 that they were able to take those American influences and integrate them so deeply within the band and come out with something as, success, as successful. So I really rate Spock's Beard. Um, I'm not an expert on them at all, but um, I toured with them. They're incredible guys, incredible virtuoso musicians, and they really know their prog. And they have um, really uh, held up the banner for prog. Um, when I returned to prog, uh, when I got the gig with IQ in 2005, I had left the prog scene behind. This is why I'm not so knowledgeable on modern prog bands. I was listening to much more extreme experimental music at that time. And I went to my mate who was a big progressive rock fan and he said, I said to him, can you just give me some albums I to listen to with sort of modern prog albums at that time? And he gave me two albums. He gave me a Porcupine Tree album and he gave me a Spock's Beard album. And I thought it was fantastic. And that was a big help when I got the gig with IQ and then Frost to be able to have a listen to see what modern progressive rock drummers were doing outside the sort of more sort of cliched prog metal world, you know, which uh, I wasn't so keen on. Um, at number four, I have what I think is one of the greatest um, uh, progressive rock bands, which was formed by a guy that should be higher on the list. I'm going to argue why he's not higher on the list. Um, the band's Utopia and the um, artist is Todd Rundgren. If there's a real genius in American progressive rock, a guy that has created his own brand of progressive rock, well, there's two people we're going to talk about uh, and, the, and the, the, other, the other guy is, is number one on this list. Uh, but... Um, in Todd Rundgren, we have someone that almost independently 
creates their own progressive rock over in America. He's not aping British progressive rock. He's not aping European progressive rock. This is a guy that is, is there right from the start. You know, Todd Rudgen first emerges in the Nas, which is sort of a garage rock band. He's listening to the Beatles, I suppose. He's listening to a whole bunch of songwriters. Um, he's very influenced by Laura Nairo to try and push songwriting. This is one of the things with Todd Rudgen that's really interesting. He's an incredible songwriter and he pushes songwriting to the fore. But um, whilst he's in the Nas, he gets interested in production and he leaves the Nas primarily to become a producer and he has a lot of success being a producer. And then he decides to uh, return as a solo artist really to try and um, explore these production ideas that are linked to songwriting. This is a recipe for genius. This is, this is what you want is someone who understands the production process and understands the songwriting process. I think that's the recipe for great progressive rock. Um, in 1970, he releases the album Something Anything, which would be better described as art rock, I suppose. He has a couple of hit records off there, which establishes him. And then in 1973, he makes A Wizard, A True Star, an album that I only heard last year. My bass player in the band I'm in, Rain, John Jarrett is a hu huge Todd Rundgren fan and has promised me a video on Todd Rundgren. So this is why I'm not elucidating that much about him because I want John, who has actually met Todd to and interviewed him to come in and talk about Todd Rundgren. I think he's a very, very important musician, which is why he's so high on the list. Um, a Wizard of True Star is a truly American progressive rock album. It's not like Utopia or, uh, sorry, it's not like... Um, I've let the cat out the bag. It's not like Kansas or Sticks, which is just sort of a AOR version of a British progressive rock band. It's his own style of prog. It's it's and he's almost invents a new genre, which we're going to see, which is the sort of avant-garde bedroom songwriter genre. It's the best way to describe. It. It's a truly avant-garde way out progressive rock album. Um, I think if he'd have, if he'd have only done that, he would be an artist that we would be describing on the fringe of the progressive rock, but in 1974, he forms a full-on progressive rock band called Utopia. They make a whole ton of albums. Um, the first album, Utopia, which I think was actually under his name, is, is perhaps the greatest true prog album to come out of the United States of America. And he follows it up with, an, you know, Raw, Oops, Wrong Planet, Adventures of Utopia. Throughout the 70s, these are masterpiece prog albums as far as I'm concerned. And so um, he's a very, very important musician. I don't want to talk about it too much because I will return to him at some point in the future. OK, so let's move on <laughs> to number three. Right. Another band I'm not so keen on. Uh, so important to the history of progressive rock. Um, and this is what you're getting with this list. I wanted to come true and show you how I feel about American, North American progressive rock bands. All these bands I've checked out at some point and all these bands, you know, with the, with the, with the, um, oh, well, well, I'll go through it again and tell you who I really like on this list. But this is a band that um, I've been around for years. Uh, that has had a huge influence. They've almost like single-handedly kept prog going over the last 30 years without a doubt. Uh, they're a gateway band now. There's so many young people that come to say rock music and then discover this band and it takes them to sort of the worlds of jazz fusion and experimental music and jazz and progressive rock. That band of course is Dream Theatre. They're on tour. They just did a, a, a gig at Manchester a couple of nights ago all my friends were there watching them cheering them clapping along to all the hits i wasn't um, i first heard dream theater in 1994 and to me it sounded like somewhere between iron maiden or rush i and it wasn't that the band weren't great they're a fantastic band i went out and bought images of words i listened to it i couldn't find anything in it personally for me that got me excited but in 1994, I was listening to Jungle and Drum and Bass. I was listening to Trip Hop. I was listening to Radiohead, Goldie, Aphex Twin, Square Pusher. Well, not quite Square Pusher. They were coming in a little bit later. But I was involved in a whole bunch of music. I believe that in, in the UK, there was a second progressive rock 
era in the early 90s, but those bands don't get classed as progressive rock. I was involved in that and I loved all that. So I heard Dream Theater and I thought, this sounds like sort of hair metal. And hair metal had gone, you know, Nirvana and Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, they'd gone and they'd erased all that. And then we had this hair metal band that sounded like, you know, hair metal, but with some odd time signatures and some cool play without a doubt. So they didn't figure on my radar that much. I had a lot of students coming to me and I was having to continually teach what Mike Portnoy was doing on those albums. Um, in 2006, I joined Frost and we released an album called Million Town. And that album um, did very well in that world. And um, the guys in Dream Theater became fans of that album. They became fans of my band. And suddenly I found myself on tour with Dream Theater uh, in 2009 I played on the UK tour with them I befriended Jordan and I befriended Mike and it was a little bit embarrassing because he was he was a bunch of guys that were in sort of the biggest progressive rock band in the world absolutely loving what we'd done and I'd sort of ignored them up until that point um I had um been in a few rehearsals with Frost the week before to make sure we were okay you know and uh the trouble when you're in a minor league prog band, there's never enough rehearsal time. So we turned up onto that tour, you know, playing by the seat of our pants, you know, trying to play Million Town, which is a track that's 25 minutes long and trying to remember it. And we probably rehearsed through it a couple of times. There used to be an excellent video on the net of us in some chalet <laughs> uh, trying to rehearse uh, Million Town with no instruments. And I'm basically playing my knees, you know, uh, to walk into the world of dream theater and I can remember we sound checked on that first day and we did it and I got and I walked off and then Dream Theatre works stopped, walked out and started to play and my jaw hit the floor. I'd never heard anything like this. This was like one of the greatest bands I'd ever heard in my life. Uh, and that's when my attitude changed towards them and I realised what an absolute powerful force they are in the world of progressive music. So if we're talking about American, US, Canadian, whatever, progressive rock bands, I've rated them at number three. So who have I got at number two, right? It can only be one band, and that is the Canadian band from Canada, who hail from Canada, which is not the United States of America, it's Canada, right? Just so you know that I have made that point, okay? All you people that got upset because I called Rush an American band along with Utopian Kansas in a video, and you have never let it be forgotten and every week I have to have at least three or four comments of people going Rush a Canadian not American and then I have to go I was talking about the continent I was just trying to but that's not the case you should respect them they're from Canada yes they are from Canada and the culture of Canada is Canada is different to America the culture of Canada has a lot more French influences and it has a lot more English influences in there as well there's a subtlety and whimsy that I find in Canadian culture and I find it in Rush's music. And even though I lump them in with American bands, I think the reason why Rush at number two on this list is because they're Canadian. And there's a cultural thing in there which is integral to progressive rock, which I think in the United States of America, they just don't quite understand. It's humour and whimsy, right? It's surreal, surrealistic, not taking yourself serious, but taking yourself massively serious. Rush are the masters of that, right? It's very difficult to, to criticize Rush because Rush always have that little wry smile that they're never really taking any of it that, that serious. You know, just when you think they've been as pompous and over the top as they possibly can be, you know, right to the start, they make a track like, I think I'm going bald, you know? Anyone who's seen them live will watch, uh, you know, the washing machines in the background and the, and the comedy routines that they play out on the screens. There, there is something beautiful about this band. I absolutely love Rush. I love them so much. Uh, they're second on this list. They, they, they can only be beaten by a genius. And anybody who's thinking about who's at the top, it's obvious now, isn't it? Have you got it right? But let's just talk a little bit about Rush. And the fact, I am now going to make the point here, that the reason I think that they trump all the other um, American prog bands is because there's a cultural difference there. 
there is a different thing and I wish I understood Canadian aesthetics better that I could really trace that through um, but for my, what I know from Canada and I've gigged in Canada uh, and I've toured there's a definite dis there's a definite difference there's a much more I suppose it's self deferential humor that seems to be stronger a humor that has derived I think from Britain I imagine that Canadians would get Faulty Towers and Dad's Army and Monty Python far more than, say, American uh, people from the United States of America would. And I find that sort of surrealism in Rush, it's there. Um, I think they were completely co committed to making incredible music, um, but they, they took it seriously, but within that seriousness is self-deprecating humor i see it all the time that's the magical mix um when i was playing in iq we ended up playing at a prog festival in montreal and it was incredible to be in montreal and to be in canada and uh you know a band like iq we all love rush so we're talking about rush and our lighting engineer lol he goes and looks on the internet and he finds out that Rush are actually playing the night before in the Enormo Dome in Montreal. Okay. And so lol being lol, this is Lawrence Dyer, IQ's um, incredible lighting tech. He manages to hook up with Howard Underliger or Leiter, what's his name? The uh, lighting guy for Rush. He manages to get to the email to him and Howard says, I'll oh, come over and, uh, uh, you know, come and have a look round. So um, we're very excited. We get we get um, tickets to see Rush, and we go along um, while they they've set the stage up. I think they've sound checked and they got some downtime. And I can remember arriving at the back at the back of the Enormo Dome and being taken in and meeting the crew. I never met the guys in Rush. They were off in their hotel room, you know, preparing for the show. Uh, uh, but Howard, I remember he came up to me and he goes, "Are you the drummer in IQ?" And I went, "Yeah." And he goes. He says, go through that door. So um, I, I remember opening this door and it was like a staircase going up in the dark. <laughs> and I walked up this staircase thinking, where the hell is this? Where's he sending me? Is this some sort of rock and roll joke? Am I going to end up falling into a pit of custard? What's going to happen? You know, a little bit trepidatious. I get to the top and I open up this little, you know, trap door and I walk in and this staircase was underneath the stage and it ran up to the interior of Neil Peart's drum kit. And I can remember opening this thing up and standing up and standing it up inside this huge 25,000 seater auditorium right in the guts of Neil Peart's kit. And I remember sitting down on Neil's stool and just sitting there and looking out and thinking in about an hour's time, Neil's gonna be sat here with the same view playing Rush you know, I remember looking over to Alex Lifeson's guitar setup and he had his pedals and then he had an army of um, Barbie dolls <laughs> behind the pedals. And I can remember looking over at, at, at uh, Geddes and Geddy had got like this array of keyboards, including foot keyboards. And in the background, he had these sort of chicken rotisserie things going around. The whole thing was surreal and incredible. And my hair stood up on the back of my neck because... When I was, say, 13, 14, 15, Neil Peart was the guy. That was the guy. That's who I wanted to be. You know, I would put on Moving Pictures or 2112. I'd stick the headphones on and play through those records, imagining that I was Neil Peart on stage, sat behind that kit. I remember looking at photographs of that drum kit and going, oh, my God, look at Peart's kit. I want that kit. Can you imagine what it would be like to sit behind it? And I did, right? That is my Rush story, and that is why I think they are one of the most important progressive rock bands in the world, and definitely the greatest American, North American, including the United States of America and all of Canada. They are the most important uh, American progressive rock band in history. There's only one person that could beat Rush to the number one slot, and that, of course, is the guy that I think, doing this channel and thinking about it as de deep as I have, is the guy that invented progressive rock. As much as I want to champion all these incredible British bands, what's the first progressive rock album? 
It is, of course, in 1966, released, I think, March 1966, all the way back then, before anyone else had done anything avant-garde, experimental, conceptual. The first guy to do it with the album Freak Out is Frank Zappa, you know. Frank Zappa is the real genius um, of rock music. There's, a, there's, only, there's only a couple of geniuses, and I think Frank is one of them. An absolute visionary. Um, so often people, when I do sort of a top 10 list of, say, the greatest progressive rock albums, Frank's not on there. I don't put Frank on there, right? I'm totally aware. The reason why I don't put Frank on there is for a whole host of reasons. One of the reasons is this. What am I going to put on that list? Say you're coming up with the 10 greatest progressive rock albums of all time. What are you going to put on that list? One size fits all. Roxy and Elsewhere. Rounding it for the money. Uncle Meat. Hot Rats. Shut up and play your guitar. What about the orchestral stuff? Okay. Um, if you're going to pick one album to represent Frank Zappa, so say I would probably go as One Size Fits All as being the greatest representative of Zappa. So you put that on the list. Inca Roads, yep, yeah, that's an incredible, one of the greatest progressive rock tunes. But then he goes into Can't Afford No Shoes, and Can't Afford No Shoes is just a straight rocker. And then there's there's Evelina Modified Dog, and then he appears with you know, Sam Badino with Johnny Guitar Watson. There's a lot of style changes, but actually Zappa's doing more than just being a progressive rock artist. The moments that you would say are progressive rock are few and far between. When he does them, they're greater and further out than any other progressive rock, but he does a whole host of other stuff. He's also one of the greatest jazz fusion artists. He's also one of the greatest rock artists. He's one of the most greatest experimental artists. Zappa goes beyond category. And if I was to include... Um, him on the list then he's going to take over the list and that's why I don't include him that is a um, a, a testament to uh, his influence I think anyway um, that is my list I've come to the end of the list I'm very aware that my uh, I've got to take my daughter somewhere and she's trying to signal to me so uh, I've got to go and do that now so uh, she's sh waving at the window that I've got to take her somewhere. So I'll go and do that. You know, my 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 dad duties now wait and I will tear myself away from the camera. So that was my 10 greatest um, artists from over the pond, over there. I'm assuming that's over where it is, over there. If you're in, a, if you're in America, United States, America, Canada or wherever you're over there as far as I'm concerned. That was my 10 greatest ranked. I hope you enjoyed it. I apologise for my lack of knowledge of some of those artists, but it might give you a better picture of where I'm coming from and why I don't mention them on this channel that much, you know. So there we go. Um, thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.